So again, I would like to thank you for attending our webinar because you uh, clearly couldn't make it to one of our in-person events. So we've decided to split this webinar up into two separate sections, a day one and a day two. So this is the entire agenda we have split over for both days, and we're going to break right in the middle. So today we'll be talking about assembly importing, scanning in Geomagic, as well as mesh manipulation. And then tomorrow, if you're joining us, we will be talking about mechanism design, digital fabrication and manufacturing for 3D printing, and then 3D printing export options as well. So for this presentation, we're going to be working with this Le Wan Sol Le Arm. And it's a simple robotic arm that fits within our budget to play around with. It uses multiple servos and is controlled using a cell phone or Bluetooth controller. We chose to work with it because it could challenge all levels of our business expertise, from modeling, scanning, and all the way to 3D printing. So in our brainstorming session, I, I chirped a colleague and I said that I could use this arm and model in SolidWorks better than he could, just using a PS3 controller. And then kind of with that, our night school concept was born. So what we're gonna do is we're going to create this gripper so the, the arm can manipulate a mouse and I can kind of put my money where my mouth is. So we started the project off in our scanning department and we used the Artec Spider to scan a mouse as well as a hand because trying to model all those complex surfaces when they, they already exist is just a, a lot of extra work that, that doesn't quite need to be done. So we started off in our scanning department using that nice Artex scanner there. And we scanned a mouse and scanned this hand because no one really wants to use surface modeling to make a hand that is crazy. Then after that, we kind of compiled all of the data inside of SolidWorks. So we have all of our scan data. We got a nice IGES file for the robot arm. And then we had to move them all together, make sure all of our fitments were good, and then prepare the models for 3D printing. So then finally, we could then print out our, our final parts. And we chose to use the HP Fusion Printer because of its near isentropic material properties, clean surfaces, and most importantly, the fast print time. So now, we're gonna take a deeper dive into the entire process from start to finish. And we're gonna touch on some of the difficulties we faced along the way, and then some of the solutions that we devised. And hopefully this information can, can help you guys in your day-to-day -day business or maybe start a new project. So the, the very first thing that we had to do was import our IGES file into SolidWorks. So to start this off, I'm gonna talk about some of the import options, feature recognition for taking all of the data from that IGES file and parameterizing it, so then you can manipulate it a lot easier. We're gonna to touch on virtual components, the assembly structure, and then make controller to make this entire arm move the way that we want it to. So there's some different import options. And the first one we're gonna talk about is 3D Interconnect. And it was introduced in 2017, and you can toggle it on and off in the import section of the system options. So lots of people when they're importing don't realize that 3D Interconnect is an option and the differences between having it on and off. So in this first section, I'm going to try my best to explain 3D Interconnect, why you'd wanna use it, the benefits of it. So then whenever you're working with non-native SOLIDWORKS files, you can make an informed decision on if you wanna use 3D Interconnect or if you do not wanna use 3D Interconnect. So 3D Interconnect can read the data in its native format and maintain a reference to that format. 3D Interconnect is great for when you're using purchased parts inside of your designs and they're shared with you in a non-SolidWorks format. So if the vendor makes a change to the part design, all they have to do is share a new file with you and it will update in all of the assemblies you use it in because the data is being read and it's not being converted over to a new file. So as the supply chain updates, so does your SOLIDWORKS data, so you can quickly and easily ensure your design still functions 
as initially intended. So there are some unique feature trees and icons that appear when you're using 3D Interconnect, and that is a nice visual tell for you to know that you're using 3D Interconnect. So as you can see, it's a SOLIDWORKS assembly with an IGES sub-assembly as its first component. So right at the top there, that is a SOLIDWORKS assembly, and then the first component has the name of the IGES file. The symbology of the icon is a SOLIDWORKS assembly icon with an arrow, and that big green arrow is representing its external link to that IGES file. So inside the subassembly, it shows all of the part files with that same 3D interconnect icon, meaning that they're all reading their geometric information from that IGES file. Inside the part files, you can see a 3D interconnect feature with a solid body generated from the IGES file. The arrow after the feature, so the dash and the greater than sign, is the actual feature that has an external reference. So that is where the external reference is, referencing that IGES file. And then the name of the body tells us the IGES file that it's referencing. So the solid body gets a name, the feature gets a name, and those all have the same name as that IGES file. So if you're using multiple imports in the same assembly, then you know where they're all coming from and where all of those references are going. So in my design scenario, I already purchased that arm and I'm not really expecting any more communication from the vendor. So all of those extra references aren't really gonna be of any benefit to me because if they make a design change and have a new version of it, it's not like I'm gonna buy that arm again and reuse it in my process. So that's why I chose to do the standard import and conversion method. So what this method does is what you see on the screen. It makes a SOLIDWORKS assembly, and then it just lists all of those components in there. So the nomenclature is kind of weird because my computer doesn't know Korean, and that is how it translated on there. So that was really fun for me, renaming all those parts as well. So inside one of those imported part files, you can see just an import feature. And that does not have that dash greater than. So it does not have an external link back to that IGES file. So it's imported, converted, and it just sits like that. So it does not have a reference to that IGES file. And that is when you turn off the 3D interconnect. So this is just the standard conversion method. So once that data is converted, you can use feature recognition to parameterize the model to make it easier to edit and work with. So FeatureWorks has an automatic and interactive mode and can generate sketches and features for sheet metal or regular solid models. So this is the base plate of the arm and it's made of sheet metal. And what we're going to do is we're going to use feature recognition to automatically extract some of the holes and then the overall geometry for the base phalange feature. So SOLIDWORKS makes quick work of the part and generates multiple features and sketches. So we can see on the left-hand side when it's just raw imported, and then you use the feature recognition, and that breaks it down into features which actually have sketches, so then you have a lot more control over the geometry of this part. So we have parametric control because now we have sketches with dimensions that have relations so we can start doing any customizations. And then if I'm doing those customizations, my drafting and manufacturing documentation is going to be just as easy as we'd expect from a SOLIDWORKS model. We can just use the model items tool and it will propagate all that information for us. We don't have to manually go in there and use reference dimensions to create everything. So the sketches are underdefined when you use that feature recognition tool. We can see it put in a bunch of relations for me, but there's, there's no real dimensions for easy editing and drawing creation. So right now, I, I don't wanna change any of the geometry, but I do want to have all of that information. So there is a great tool 
to allow me to do that. And that is the fully defined sketch tool. It's going to look at all of my sketch entities and then dimension them for me. So I'm going to open up the sketch here of this base plate. And of course, it's underdefined. It has all those blue lines. And under the display delete relations command, there is the fully defined sketch. And I can choose which relations I'm going to allow SolidWorks to apply the origin locations for my dimensions. But just like that, it will fully define my sketch for me, giving me all of the parametric control that I would expect. So I can then use some direct editing techniques like Instant 3D to reposition or reshape these components. So what I want to do is I just want to shave in this bracket here so then I can put some markers for when we're making videos for this component. I just need that base to be a little bit thinner. So now I can change that parameter and then I can spit this out into a drawing very easily. The next uh, task I have is collaborating. So I, I worked on this project with a whole bunch of people across North America. I'm way up in Canada, and some of my colleagues are down in California, and then I got some in the Midwest, and we needed a way to collaborate together. So normally with assemblies, they reference all of the part files. And this la arm here had a a whole bunch of part files. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use virtual components to make that collaboration a little bit easier so I don't have to send the assembly and all of the part files. I can make them all virtual. So a virtual component is a component that is stored inside of the assembly. So all of the graphical and parametric information lives inside of the assembly. So a pro for that is that you don't need to send all the reference files but a con could be that your assembly start getting a lot larger because they have to store all of that parametric information. So that's really ideal if you don't need to make any technical documentations of these parts. So I just bought them all. I don't need to manufacture them, so I don't need to make any drawings of them. So I can make them all virtual components. They don't need a spot on my hard drive. They don't need a drawing file to reference it. And that, again, makes it easier to share and collaborate. So a visual representation we get of if a component is virtual or not is going to be the square brackets that surround the name of it. So you can see in the blue box there, there's that one component that I made virtual and the rest of them are not. And we can see it's virtual because of those square brackets there. So looking at my IGES file, it contained 305 parts and 82 of those which were unique. So that would be a lot of part files generated if I were to just save that assembly. And then every time I want to collaborate and share with everyone, we have to move those 82 unique files around. So in order to simplify the file set, all I have to do is make all of those components virtual, which will save them inside of the assembly instead of as a unique part file. So to convert a part to a virtual component, all you have to do is you just right click on it and you make it virtual. So that took my entire assembly from one assembly file and then 82 part files down to just one file that we could share amongst each other and use to collaborate. The next kind of uh, issue I had was with the assembly structure. So all of those components came in at the top level. So usually you can use the assembly structure to kind of coincide with manufacturing. So you can make sub assemblies. So if you're assembling one section of it and then another section of it and combining them together, you can use those as both sub assemblies. And then that also helps with isolating some of the components for your technical documentation, whether it's assembly instructions of one portion before another, or you just want to detail one section, those sub assemblies can help. Um, they, that came with an instruction manual. Again, I don't need to make technical documentations on this. What I used the assembly, the assembly structure for was to form rigid connections between the components. So when I first got the assembly, it was underdefined, but it was in a position where all the components were in the correct orientation. 
So instead of me mating all 300 of the parts, what I decided to do was create some sub-assemblies between the components that had no relative motion. So for example, this lower arm section here that I'm box selecting, that's all rigidly connected. So I'm going to create a new sub-assembly while I'm inside the main assembly. So then all those components will maintain their position relative to one another, but it'll allow the entire sub-assembly to move. So I can grab that entire sub-assembly and they move as one piece. So that saves me a bunch of mates and it also helps me organize the parts. So then I can just call this sub-assembly the, the lower arm section because all of this kind of Korean translation just was, was too hard to tell. So after I organized into a few sub-assemblies, there was minimal mates to do, and that made my, my life a lot easier. I was really dreading all of the mates I was thinking I had to put in there until I just used the assembly structure to solve that problem. So the next tool that I used was the mate controller because we could program all these servos depending on certain angles. And the mate controller tool was perfect to see what angle each servo needed to be at in order to understand the motion that we could do. So the mate controller tool can control motions in your assemblies that have kind of open degrees of freedom. You can manipulate the mates numerically with a slider with little arrow increments, and then you can save specific positions. And with those positions, you can create configurations, which you can then reference in your technical documentation, whether that's in Composer or just a drawing. Or you can create animations through those positions, like you see on the screen here, uh, which is making the arm dance. So once all the mates and the sub-assemblies are created, you, you kind of get behavior like this. You, you try and move one component around and then some of the other loose mates start to flip flop and it, it gets really cumbersome and difficult to isolate the joints. So I'm sure we've all experienced something like this. You're just trying to drag one part and then other parts start behaving all weird and you're like, what are you doing? So that's where the mate controller comes in. So what you can do is you can collect all of your mates and they will be presented here on the screen. And you can see with the slider, I can move them around, up and down, and I'm gonna lock it into that exact position I want to make my nice little dancing arm here. So once I'm happy with the position, I can update it, and then I can make a new position. So now that I've updated position one, I'm gonna come in here and slide into position two, get this to line up the exact way that I want here. And of course, I can read these numbers to then program into my little robot servo here. So I'm gonna create a new position, that's position two. And right here at this button, I can add a configuration. So with one click, I now have a configuration for that position. And then with the little animation at the bottom of the property manager, you can animate through all of those positions. So to recap, in that assembly import section, I talked about the import options, so the difference between 3D interconnect and the standard import and convert, then feature recognition to parameterize some of those imported solid bodies. I used virtual components to save all of my components into the assembly. So then I didn't have 302 part files every time I was collaborating. And then I used the assembly structure to create sub-assemblies. And I did that to save myself from having to mate every single component. When I imported that IGES file, it was all in the right place, but there was no mates and everything had open degrees of freedom. So putting them in a sub-assembly and then making that sub-assembly rigid kind of locked all those components into position for me. So once I had my uh, arm ready to go, then it was time to start scanning and processing the scan data. 
So in this section, I'm going to talk about kind of what 3D scanning is, what we can use the technology for, the different types of scanning technology, then some of the RTEC scanners that we here at Hawkridge show, and then a nice video demonstration of one of my colleagues actually scanning the mouse for me. So there are many types of scanning technologies available, and I'm just going to give a nice brief overview description of them all. So the first one we have is photogrammetry. And what that does is that will capture several photos and it's going to triangulate key feature points between each one to generate a 3D mesh. So if we look at this graphic on the screen here, you can see all of those little planes represent a photograph. And those photographs are used to look at a different projection to then generate the 3D image. The next type is structured light. So this will project a known image onto a surface and then log the deviation of that calibrated image. So it uses a projector, projects those lines, and then a camera will read those and it will form some reference points and then use those reference points to generate a mesh. The next type is a time of flight or TOF. So what that does is that will fire a laser in a direction and then calculate the time it takes to reflect back to generate points for a mesh in 3D space. So it'll create a whole bunch of little points and then some software will take those points and generate a mesh from it. And finally, the last type is laser triangulation. So that combines structured light and photogrammetry by shining a laser onto an object and taking photos from different perspectives. So the laser point is going to help focus the camera and create reference points when constructing all of those 2D images into a three-dimensional collection. So those are the four main types of scanning. So the ArcTech handheld scanners, those are based on the structured light method of scanning. So again, it has a projector that's going to project an image, and then a camera that's going to record the image, see how that image distorts around the object, and then start building the three-dimensional mesh from there. So some of the benefits over other scanning methods is going to be the usability for small objects or large ones because that image is scalable. So depending on how close or how far away you go, it will still work. So you can scan multiple points at once and it automatically aligns them with the software. So you don't have to go put reference stickers on whatever you're scanning. The image does that automatically for you. And since it is a camera, it can capture both color, texture, and geometry. And then of course, the really high frame rate means that it has increased levels of accuracy. So this slide right here shows the Artec product line and then some of the applications that you can apply it to. So reverse engineering there, that's highlighted in red. And that, that is a really common use for the scanner. So I know one project I had, again, I'm up here in Edmonton, Alberta. It's an oil and gas place. We like to call ourselves the Texas of Canada. But uh, I got this giant pump impeller dropped on my desk and half of it was worn and, and it, half of it was half decent. And the guys said that the company that makes this went out of business in the 60s. There's no drawings for it, but they, they need to get that pump up and running. So I took a scanner. I scanned the half good side, cleaned up, inferred a little bit of data, and then mirrored it over, and then made them a nice drawing so they could get that machined. You can also use it for industrial design and manufacturing. So you can use scanners for an inspection process as well or to if you're molding something out of clay then you want it out of metal you can scan it and then get some 3d 
data from those hand molds or things like that. You can use it for healthcare, uh, science and education, and then finally, art and design. So this is the scale of where you want to use those RTEC scanners. So if you're doing really, really small things, you want to go with the Space Spider because it has the highest accuracy and the best resolution. And then if you're doing really large things, you can go up to the Ray, which uses LiDAR for large buildings or big industrial vehicles, things like that. So the Artex Space Spider is a high resolution 3D scanner based on blue light technology. And it's perfect for capturing small objects or intricate details of large industrial objects in high resolution with steadfast accuracy and brilliant color. The scanner's ability to render complex geometry, sharp edges, and thin ribs sets this technology apart. So it's ideal for an industrial 3D scanner for capturing objects like molding parts, PCBs, keys, coins, or even the human ear. The Space Spider offers almost unlimited possibilities in areas such as reverse engineering, quality control, product design, and manufacturing. So some of the key features of this is that it has an accuracy of 0.05 millimeters, and it's under two pounds. So as you're waving this thing around with your arm, it's not going to get tired, you're not going to get fatigued, you're not going to have to take breaks because it's under two pounds. The next one is the EVA. So this one's light, fast, and versatile. And it's usually the most popular scanner and is one of the market leaders in handheld 3D scanners. So it uses that structured light scanning technology, and it's an excellent all-around solution for capturing objects of pretty much any kind, including ones with black and shiny surfaces. So the ease of use, speed, and precision has made it an essential product for a wide range of industries. So from rapid prototyping to quality control, CGI to heritage preservation, the automotive industry to forensics, medicine and prosthetics to aerospace, the devices used to customize, innovate, and streamline countless forward-thinking industries. So some of the key features of this are a 0.1 millimeter accuracy and the 1.3 megapixel camera. And again, it doesn't need any markers for calibration. You just plug it in and you start scanning. The Leo here is one of the first 3D scanners to offer an onboard automatic processing. So it's able to provide the most intuitive workflow, making 3D scanning as easy as taking a video on your cell phone. So as you scan your object, you can see the 3D replica being built in real time on the Leo's touch panel screen. You can rotate the 3D model to make sure you've captured all the areas. So if you have any parts that you missed, you can see it before you plug it into the software and realize you gotta do your scan again. So the advantages over the EVA there is that it has 80 frames per second compared to the 16. It does the wireless scanning, so you don't need a dongle to connect it to a computer. It's got a bigger camera, and of course it has that live data transfer and screen streaming. And finally, the last scanner I'm gonna talk about is the Artec Ray, which is a high accuracy, long range laser 3D scanner. So it's ideal for precise capture of large objects, so things like wind turbines, ship propellers, airplanes, buildings, and you can produce 3D scans of the highest quality. So the Artec Ray scans with sub-millimeter distance precision and has the best-in-class angular accuracy. So some of the key features here is it has a range of up to 110 meters. It's got two 5-megapixel cameras, and it is an accuracy of 0.7 millimeters at a distance of 15 millimeters away. So now, so to finish off our presentation for today, we're gonna to talk about mesh manipulation. So we got our scan data, and scan data can come in a whole bunch of different formats. It can be a point cloud data, just a bunch of points, or some mesh data. Mesh could be solid 
or it could just be an exterior surface. So we're gonna look at all the different tools that SolidWorks has in order to manipulate that mesh data. And of course, we will look at the nice example that I used in this project here of making a mouse. And then finally, a hand that can perfectly grip that mouse. So for this mesh modeling, there are different options that you can work with inside of SOLIDWORKS. You can do mesh modeling, which is directly editing those mesh models. You can use scan to 3D to try and convert the mesh models to SOLIDWORKS geometry. Or you can use the GeoMagic add-in inside of SOLIDWORKS to do both of those things, either manipulate the mesh natively or great tools to convert it to surfaces. So the mesh body tool set allows you to work directly with the mesh data inside of SOLIDWORKS. So again, this is not converting it. You are manipulating that mesh data. So the main use cases include directly inferencing mesh vertices in the sketches. So this allows you to use the mesh as a smart sketch picture. So you can reference points on there to either recreate geometry or measure, use as reference, whatever you need to do. There is a mesh to surface command, which allows you to extract primitive surfaces from the mesh. So things like flat planes and cylindrical faces. You grab a group of faces from the mesh, and then you can convert them into planes or cylinders, spheres, things like that. Just nice primitive shapes. You can also perform Boolean operations with other bodies to either modify the mesh, or you can just use that mesh in your design as is. So let's take a look at some examples of that. So first of all, mesh bodies can be opened through just the standard open dialog. So you can hit open, find your mesh body, and then you can open it up. So you can import it directly into an existing part, or you can just open it into its own part. So before we import any parts, it's really important to understand the options available when opening a mesh file. So inside of the SOLIDWORKS system options, under import, we're gonna find all of the options to import the mesh as either a solid, a surface, or just a graphics body. So it's important to understand that a mesh body will generally only be able to import as a solid or a surface body if it was originally created in some sort of CAD system and then exported to a mesh file type. So in order to import as a solid body, the mesh has to be perfectly uniform and has to be watertight. So scan data, as well as mesh that was created in non-CAD software, such as those used for video games, are usually only just the external shell of whatever it is. So those are imported as graphics bodies, and then we'll have to start using our mesh modeling tools to either edit them, clean them up, work with them, whatever we wanna do. So even if the mesh file can be imported as a solid body, the size of the mesh may limit this ability. Excessively large files, so ones that have a ton of mesh triangles, may still have to be opened as a graphics body because there are just too many surfaces and it's just too big. So the size of the mesh can be processed in either scan to 3D or the GeoMagic add-in to make it a little bit smaller, cut down the number of surfaces so then it's easier to open. Another common issue is selecting the correct unit system. So when you're working with STL files, the STL file does not store units in there. It is just a coordinate system and it's unitless. So since these STL files don't store any unit information, you need to manually set the units that you're exporting from and importing from and you wanna make sure they're the same. So the most common unit for this workflow is millimeters. But if you choose the wrong unit system, it can be quite obvious as the model will either be 25.4 times too large or 
too small. So you can just go in and do a quick measurement, like I have done in here in SolidWorks, and you can confirm that it is actually the correct size instead of this really tiny one here if you choose the wrong units. So either if you are doing the scanning, making sure you are sticking to the same units when you export and import, or communicating effectively with whoever gave you the scan data can kind of nip that problem before it occurs. So the first mesh modeling tool we're gonna to look at is inferencing sketch points. So mesh bodies can be directly referenced in either 2D or 3D sketches using standard sketch relations. So this is one of the fastest ways to use your mesh data to locate things like mounting features or slot holes. So our first kind of design approach was we were going to utilize some of the screw holes to mount this mouse to our robot arm. So then we could just inference these sketch points, get the distance these holes need to be so we can start making our connecting body. So if the STL file is imported as a graphics body, then you have to use the convert to mesh body tool. And what that will do is that will convert it from just graphics to a mesh body. So this is necessary for many of the tools such as combine, but not for referencing the mesh and sketches or extracting primitive surfaces. Those can be done from graphics bodies. So right now we have just a standard SOLIDWORKS model and we're going to convert it into mesh geometry. And we have sliders here where we can adjust the STL file by the maximum element size, angle deviation, things like that. So this was SOLIDWORKS geometry. And we came in here and we converted it to a mesh body. And we did that because in order to use our Boolean operations, they have to be the same body type. So later on, we're gonna bring in our mouse file and we will use the subtract tool to subtract the surfaces of the mouse file from our holder here to get a nice interface. Another tool we can use is the surface cuts tool. So right now I have a graphics body and I can cut with the surface. And it's giving me a warning. It's hard to undo when you do a graphics body. And we can see that it is in fact just a, an open shell, but the undo tool can undo any edits that you do to a graphics body. So now we're gonna take this graphics body and we're gonna convert it into a mesh body. And what that's going to do is that's going to solidify the inside. So now when I cut with this surface on the mesh body, and then I hide my surface, I can see that it is in fact solid. Another tool we have at our disposal for mesh bodies is the slicing tool. So if I need to do more than create sketch references or perform Boolean operations, then this slice tool can extract actual cross sections from a mesh. To do this, I need to select a reference plane or a flat base to orient the cross section, and then multiple cross sections can be extracted simultaneously. You can turn off the exact intersection command if your mesh is really clean and you don't need all of those hard points. And you can use these sliders here to isolate a certain area. So we only want the outside where the outside of the hand is going to connect. So when I hide my graphics body here, I can see that everywhere where one of those planes intersected, I have a series of sketches. Now these series of sketches are perfectly set up for my loft tool. And I can come in here and I can loft in between them. And then I am no longer working with mesh data. This is an actual SOLIDWORKS body. So I have the full suite of SOLIDWORKS tools at my disposal now if I wanna start manipulating this body. We can also extract some primitive surfaces from the mesh. So the surface from mesh tool, we're gonna to look for planar surfaces. And all I do is I grab some sample faces. So I'm gonna grab as many faces 
on this kind of flat planar area. I can play around with my facet tolerance. And then when I hit calculate, SolidWorks will grab all of the necessary faces for me that are still within that plane. And one more time, just at the bottom, and I'm going to grab all three of these planar faces. So again, I'm just clicking some sample faces right down here. And then the calculate button, SolidWorks will grab those surfaces for me and generate some SolidWorks surfaces. So again, these are no longer mesh. This is one surface that I can use my surfacing tools on, thicken them, expand them, whatever I need to do. And finally, the Boolean operations. So this is the method that I ended up using with for my design. So I took the scan of the mouse and the scan of the hand, and I used Boolean operations to subtract the mouse from the hand to create a perfect interface between the two. So the mouse body is a mesh body, and this gripper was created just using standard SolidWorks features. So using the convert to mesh body tool, I'm going to convert the standard SOLIDWORKS geometry to a mesh body, and then that will allow me to use my Boolean operations. Right now, those two bodies are interlapping, but I can just subtract the mouse from my gripper, and then I can see I have a perfect interface between the two. And I'm using perfect a little loosely because it is the exact copy of the surface of the scan data. So if my scan data is really good, then I can get a really good surface. So this gripper was just a, a test to make sure that it could actually move. We ended up using the same process for the entire hand model. So what can you do with these results? Well, first of all, you can quickly extract measurements and references by inferring those sketch points. You can edit the mesh files directly or you can use the mesh bodies directly in your design. So if you don't want to make any changes to it, you can just start mating to some of those faces. So making those primitive surfaces makes it easier for mating. And that's why we did that to the bottom. So we could mate it to a table plane when we move the mouse around. So another workflow we have is scan to 3D. And that's an add-in available to SOLIDWORKS professional users, and that is made for processing your mesh data. You can also use it to extract surface bodies directly from that mesh. So same kind of idea, different tool set to make it work. So you have to enable Scan to 3D by turning the add-in on, and then you can open your mesh files with Scan to 3D. So just hitting the drop down, turning on scan to 3D, then you will open the mesh files with the scan to 3D tool. So all of this process is best to be done in the scanning software, but if you don't have access to that, you are just given the raw scan data, then this is a tool suite that you have inside of SOLIDWORKS. So the first thing you have to do is you have to orient the mesh. So the mesh data is often in an inconvenient location or orientation in respect to the SOLIDWORKS coordinate system. And that makes future sketches and features a little bit more difficult to create. So SOLIDWORKS will automatically attempt to position the mesh, but after this is done, there's also options to manually rotate and translate the mesh to fine tune its placement. So my goal here is to make the bottom of the mouse parallel to the top plane, and that's what I've done. The next tool we have is the extraneous data removal. So to remove this extraneous data or noise from our scan, we can come in here and we can use some of these selection tools. And we're just going to do a volume selection. So I just need those outside surfaces. So I'm going to delete that inside. I can then make this boundary tool, remove that piece, because that's not where my hand's going to touch. This button in here is way too complex. I can use the lasso select and delete it. And I have started to kind of simplify my scan data here, just by removing information that I don't need. 
the next thing we want to do is we want to simplify some of the edges to reduce the mesh size. So we have a slider here of, with a global simplification. And by sliding that around to different percentages, we can see the original mesh size compared to our new mesh size numerically on the left-hand side in the property manager. And then we can see those results again graphically on the right-hand side. Then we need to smooth that out. Once we've simplified some of the tessellations, we can do some additional smoothing. So both global and local smoothing can help improve the quality of surface patches generated from the mesh. So we can see here that as that boundary slid, my hole smoothed out. It is no longer so tessellated. It's a bit cleaner of a curve. And then we can fill in some holes. So holes can occur either because I made the hole or just gaps in the scan data. If the scan wasn't done accurately enough, there could potentially be holes as well. So all the holes are automatically selected. Lots of them are super small, but we can see with a nice simple click of the arrow, all of those holes were patched for me. And then now we need to create some actual surfaces from this data. And that's where the surface wizard tool comes into play. So there's guided creation or automatic creation. And we just have this slider for surface detail. So right now it's breaking it up into 151 surfaces. I can try and make it a little more fine with 360, pull it a little more coarse with 56, and pick whichever looks best to me. So everything in the red there, those are invalid surfaces and those are just going to get removed when I hit my check mark, but that looks pretty good. That will be good enough for me to be able to cut with. So again, what am I gonna do with these results? Well, I'm gonna take those surfaces and I'm going to use them to remove some of the geometry of whatever's going to be gripping the mouse. So we can see just the cut with surface tool, cut away and an example of the cut with surface tool will remove the material based upon those surfaces that I extracted from the scan data. And now I have a nice solid body. It's one piece with all of that data removed. So the last and final topic for this webinar is going to be the GeoMagic add-in for SolidWorks. So Geomagic for SolidWorks is part of a family of products for true reverse engineering. So if you're regularly working with scan data and need more advanced tool with a much higher amount of control as well as automation, then this is definitely the best option for you. Geomagic can repair, simplify, smooth, orient the mesh data more easily and faster than scan to 3D. But its auto surfacing capabilities are, are truly amazing. So without even simplifying or removing mesh data or smoothing, Geomagic can automatically generate completely solid part files from a good scan. All you do is you open it in SolidWorks, you hit the auto surface button, you hit the check mark, you wait a little bit. So this is real time, there's no movie magic happening here. And just like that, we have a nice solid body that was generated from our scan data. So Geomagic is the best option if you need a full solid model. It auto-generated an error-free and accurate model within minutes for us to use for interference detection inside of a working SolidWorks assembly. It was also used to create the model of our scanned hand that became the basis for the final design of our clamp and trigger button fingers. So we can see here, this is the mechanism design, a little bit of foreshadowing of what we're gonna get into tomorrow. So this nice little cam, spins controlled by the servo of the robot arm to give me my left click and right click, everything I need to model inside of SolidWorks. So the three topics we covered today 
are the assembly importing, scanning, and geomagic, and then manipulating that mesh. In tomorrow's webinar, we're going to talk about some of the mechanism design we did, the digital fabrication and manufacturing, so some of the rules and limitations we had to design for for our 3D printer, and then finally our 3D printing export options. So with that, I'd like to thank you guys for watching.